This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, in for Francine. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Turkish stocks resume trading after a circuit breaker as the nation's election looks to be heading for a second round of voting. The lira weakens along with European stocks that have exposure to the country. President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy plan to meet tomorrow as debt ceiling negotiations appear to gather momentum. Global equities move higher. Plus, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky meets UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in London today after receiving promises of support from Italy, Germany and France when it comes to the military over the weekend. A quick check on the markets this morning. We are getting some breaking lines uh, when it comes to the EU Commission. Is that going to move the euro here? They have raised their eurozone inflation and GDP forecast for this and next year. The, for, the inflation forecast for 2023 is now at 5.8 percent. It was at 5.6 for 2024. It goes to 2.8 from 2.5 percent. And the forecast for GDP for this year is at 1.1 percent, 1.6 percent for 2024, saying that downside risks to the economic outlook have indeed risen. Well, the euro is stronger this morning. Overall, we are seeing some dollar weakness. There has been that Pavlovian urge to buy the dollar over those debt ceiling fears, over just general economic fears. Some of that waning out this morning. Does the dollar downside continue once again? The dollar is, of course, much stronger uh, versus the lira so far this morning. Now, we are looking at a 10-year yield that moves higher, up two basis points. That flattening in the curve has been happening since Friday when we got the UMich survey. Again, inflation concerns. That being entrenched is really rife throughout these global markets. That's what UMIT showed us. Perhaps that's what these European Commission figures are showing us, too. Gold has been the winner when it comes to the debt ceiling debates. That's according to our latest MLive poll survey. Gold ranked highest is where you want to hide out. Now, overall, European indices, those are moving higher this morning, up two tenths of 1%. When it comes to the regional breakdown, you are seeing some outperformance in France. Consumer goods, those outperforming this morning. Uh, FTSE 100, that's that's up about three tenths of one percent. So most of these regional benchmarks heading higher. Now, Turkey is likely heading for two weeks of political uncertainty after both President Erdogan and his main opposition rival failed to win a majority in the country's election. The latest results show Erdogan leading the vote, but short of the 50 percent needed to avoid a second round. Let's go to Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Din, who's in Istanbul. Yusuf, you spent the morning talking to experts uh, about this election. What's been the reaction so far to the results? I mean, a little bit of a sense of surprise, Danny, because remember the pollsters going into this had expected Kemal Klitsch de Rolo uh, to really do a lot better than he eventually did in round one. Based on preliminary results, he trailed the incumbent president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and it raises further questions about where it leaves the challenger for the second round, because the reality is that a lot of the followers of Sinan Olgan, who got 5.3 percent in round one, those people, for the most part, are likely to vote for Recep Tayyip Erdogan if it came down to it, if they had to make a decision. And so President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, perhaps ironically, in round two is in a better position than he was in round one. Adding to that even further are some of the initial parliamentary results that give another tailwind to the incumbent. But ultimately, it raises bigger questions about the longer term trajectory of economic policy. We're seeing the markets fierce repricing on quite a few fronts, Danny. Yeah, get more into that, Yusuf. What have we seen in terms of market reaction? Well, on the equity side of things, we hit the circuit breaker initially. Uh, the banks selling off hard. Uh, now we're giving back some of the initial losses. But what I would look out for are some of the bond losses as well. Corporate bonds are selling off at the same time. You're seeing the overnight funding rate for Liras surge by about 400 percent. And then the other thing that's come to light are the credit default swaps. Remember, dollar lira isn't always the best proxy to understand uh, investor positioning. You know, there is quite a bit of intervention from the central bank. The CDS is on a five year basis telling you a story of 600 basis points, the highest level since March 21. And this is a warning signal from the market, which has been positioning for what is widely considered a market friendly outcome. The initial results we have clearly are not that. And this is what the market's telling you, Danny. 
Yusuf, thank you so much for your coverage throughout today. Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal then in Istanbul. Now to another election in Thailand where pro-democracy parties have dominated the parliamentary election. The results set up the biggest challenge to the royalist-backed establishment since the military seized power in a coup nearly a decade ago. Let's go to Bloomberg's Asia Markets editor Margot Tawi in Bangkok. Margot, just how significant is this result for Thailand? It's very significant. It's uh, surprising in the number of votes that went to the opposition parties, two in particular. Uh, both of them were expected to do well, but not as well as they did. Uh, so that's the big surprise. And it really is uh, a step back for the, the military-backed parties that have ruled Thailand for almost a decade now. Um, where they go from here, where the military goes from here, remains to be seen. But the, uh, the two opposition parties are talking already about forming a government. Uh, they're also in talks with some other smaller opposition parties with the hope of forming a coalition, which they need. That neither of them can, can um, serve a government in their own, in their own right. Um, mm. One of the hurdles that they face, however, is a Senate that was appointed by the military junta. Uh, and that will have a say in who is appointed prime minister. They will have an equal vote to the mem members of the lower house of government. So that remains to be seen. The, we're, we're not out of it yet. Uh, there'll be some weeks of negotiating and horse trading, no doubt, before we see the formation of a new government. So. What does it mean for investors in the meantime as we wait for the new government and potential next steps after that government forms? Typically in Thailand you don't see a lot of reaction from investors to political changes and the reason is that the, uh, the policies typically don't change that much. Um, in this election there's been a lot of promises of, of pump priming. Um, of, of consumers particularly so uh, people can pick up spending. So you have seen and you can, you will see, I imagine, um, a pick up in some of the consumer related shares. Uh, banks may do well, loans and so forth. Um, all in all, it, it, it looks fairly good for investors this morning. We also had a good set of GDP numbers out for the last quarter, um, which bodes well for the year ahead. Um, that said, the hiatus between the election and forming the government means there will be some delay in policy making and spending. Mm. So, uh, you know, really overall, I don't really think it will um, impact investors that much. And that's what we're seeing right. from analysts. That's their view. Okay. Well, it certainly has been an interesting day for EMFX. Margo, thank you so much. That's Bloomberg's Margo Tawi in Bangkok. Coming up, President Biden and U.S. congressional leaders will resume debt ceiling negotiations on Tuesday. We'll discuss more of that next. This is Bloomberg. is probably not the absolute best time to jump in. It comes right down to the wire. As we get to the 11th hour, the volatility spikes and equity markets can correct. Markets get volatile, maybe the stock market go down. You don't want to position and, you know, add to equities right ahead of that. The only way we can play this is to stand back, be careful. By a one month, uh, two month treasury bill. There is a huge flight to safety. A lot of defensive sectors look high priced. Safety trade has become big tech again. Investors continue to seek shelter there. And I'm not sure it's as safe as it looks. I wouldn't want to try and get too cute around timing my portfolio based on uh, the whims of, uh, of a handful of politicians in Washington. Some of our guests there discussing the M Live polls question about where to invest as U.S. debt ceiling talks progress. Speaking of which, President Biden and U.S. congressional leaders are planning to meet Tuesday to resume those debt ceiling negotiations. National Economic Council Director Leo Brainard told CBS that talks are serious and constructive, but reiterated just how serious a default will be. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg senior economics reporter Michelle Damrisco. Uh, Michelle, we're still trying to figure out where this game of chicken stands at the moment. Where are we when it comes to this negotiation process? 
Yeah, it really is a game of chicken, right, Danny? I mean, it's hard to tell when the, you've got the political back and forth. That's just such a thick layer over everything and a sort of blame game that continues on that side while everyone tries to say, oh, we won't default, but, uh, you know, nobody really has that certainty right now. So where we stand is we're all kind of clinging to that hope that the Tuesday meeting between President Biden and, and Speaker McCarthy actually yields some signs of progress. Now, remember last week when this meeting was delayed, uh, our reporting showed that it was delayed for good reasons, that the staff level talks, especially around energy proposals, around fossil fuel production and some green energy items, those were progressing enough to make a delay happen for the, the leader level. So now we hope to see more signs of progress tomorrow. In the meantime, we're hearing more from either side that both sides are uh, see the other as, as a recalcitrant and, and not able to kind of close this deal as we approach that June 1 X date. Well, maybe some of that progress uh, solidifies or justifies some of the lack of reaction from, from equity markets. Of course, there's been some reaction in T-bills and bond markets. But, but what is at stake for investors and the U.S. public here? Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, a lot of investors probably don't want to put their money where their mouth is just yet, but they are growing in nerves. And I think one thing to point out, especially off of that MLive Pulse survey, is that uh, many investors think that this is worse than previous episodes. Of course, we've been down this road before, unfortunately, uh, but they're seeing it as a, a, a more uncertain landscape than we've seen, for instance, in 2011 when we had a similar, uh, you know, challenge going on. So that is at stake. And, and of course, uh, in the limelight is, is what happens to U.S. Treasuries. Of course, the Treasury Secretary... Uh, tried to reassure in, in some terms uh, with uh, Anne-Marie Hordern in her interview last week that, uh, you know, the U.S. Treasury uh, would, would not default. But, you know, at the same time, she also could not guarantee that. So there is a huge, and, and she did warn Yellen uh, talking about economic and financial cat catastrophe um, if, they're, if they don't pull this through. So, of course, stakes are very, very high, a uh, lot of uncertainty. And, and folks on the ground, you know, outside of the investment world, I think a lot of everyday Americans are worried about what happens uh, in the event of default to Social Security payments, to federal government salaries, to daily operations of critical agencies like the Federal Aviation Administration, Customs and Border Patrol. So we could real, really have a real mess on our hands uh, as we approach that X date. Once we get through that X date, and, and you know, hopefully we do, I wonder if we'll kind of turn our attention back to inflation. If, if this is sort of dominating some of the headlines, mm -hmm. but in reality, perhaps what's most worrying for bond markets um, is a UMICH survey where inflation expectations are at a 12-year high. Yeah, it really is, you know, tough to, to make that call right now. Of course, we've got still some weeks of data before the Fed meets again. Um, you know, we had been seeing signs of disinflation. Of course, a lot of people pointing to uh, Powell's favorite measure on services, ex-housing, looking pretty good in terms of coming down or at least moving in the good in a good direction, easing off of highs. So, uh, you know, there are those signs. But, yeah, you know, consumer expectations are a whole different ball game, and if people don't feel it, then we could be in a, in a real pickle when uh, consumers are feeling like the prices will just increase, and then that kind of tends to, you know, have its own effect on uh, eventual price growth. So a lot more to come on that front. I'm sure we'll be debating that in the weeks to come before the Fed decision. A, a debate it feels like we're, we're constantly having. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. Always Bloomberg's Every day. Michelle Every day. Jamrisco. <laughs> Every day in Singapore. Thanks for debating it with us. All right, let's get to your Bloomberg First Word News. With that is Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Hi, Danny. The UK and Switzerland are kicking off negotiations for a new trade agreement to boost ties between the two nations. Trade Secretary Kemi Badenoch is set to meet her Swiss counterpart in Bern today with formal negotiations due to begin next week. The prize for the two sides is a reduction in trade barriers in areas like finance and legal and professional services. Now, G7 finance chiefs have concluded their meeting in Japan by presenting a united front on more support for Ukraine. And while China didn't get a direct mention in the group statement, there were thinly veiled plans to counter Beijing's dominance of global supply chains. The G7's unity comes in stark contrast with the discord seen at the G20 in India less than three months earlier, which ended without the usual communique. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has conceded a loss in the southern swing state of Karnataka. Rahul Gandhi's Congress party scored a rare victory, taking 60% 
percent of seats in the state congress its biggest win against modi's bjp since 2014 the winning party's campaign included promises of direct cash benefits for women and also free electricity gold giant newmont has agreed to buy australia australian rival newcrest mining in a deal worth 19 billion dollars the transaction sees newmont consolidate its position as the world's biggest producer of bullion with mines across the americas africa asia and also australia it comes as global gold miners are facing the prospect of stagnating production and rising import costs global news powered by more than 2700 journalists Journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans, and this is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thank you so much. All right, coming up on the program, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is expected in London today as part of his European tour. What is he hoping to get from his trip? We're going to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has just arrived in the UK. That's after he stopped in Italy, Germany, and France over the weekend as part of his EU tour. Now, in Berlin, the German government announced its biggest military package for Ukraine as the country bets on a successful counteroffensive against Russia. Our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, is with us now. Um, Maria, so we have a big diplomatic push from Zelensky, one we probably haven't seen in months. What is he getting out of this? Uh, yes, Danny, and it's not over because, as you say, he is in London today that completes or should complete uh, unless there's a surprise in the works uh, from the Ukrainians. Uh, the story has been, as you say, in Italy, France, Germany and the UK. All of these countries, frankly, they're important to Ukraine for a number of different reasons. Uh, but as you noted, on Saturday, there was a real uh, highlight, which is that package that was announced by the German government, the biggest uh, to date, 2.7 billion euros worth of new weapons, obviously, uh, tactically important for Ukraine, but also symbolically relevant, uh, too, because there had been questions about whether or not there was fatigue uh, when it comes to the allies and, and this counteroffensive. I think when you look at the situation in the UK, well, probably very similar uh, today. There will be a conversation about the weapons. Uh, remember, the UK has had a lot of bravado in terms of this idea that Russia will lose and Ukraine wins, but obviously the country says they need weapons and potentially fighter jets. Remember, this has been in the work uh, for months now when it comes to the UK. The other issue that I presume will come up to is NATO. Remember, Danny, there is an important NATO meeting that will happen in July, the Vilnius summit in Lithuania, and Ukraine has manifestly said it wants to get a clear uh, roadmap to NATO membership uh, for the next, uh, well, the future. Will they get the dates that they want this roadmap? That is still a question that is up for play. Also, uh, amid this flurry of diplomacy, we also had the G7, a G7 where the communique was probably different than, than prior world meetings because of, of China. So where does China stand in this whole thing, Maria? Uh, yes, and it was a straightaway condemnation from the G7, but as you say, this is an easy one. The problems we've seen come or happen at the G20 level, uh, Russia will block any statement that me mentions or features uh, the word war, and China is clearly on the sidelines. Now, when it comes to the Chinese, this is interesting because we have seen this flurry of diplomacy. Remember, China had very successfully, to some extent, inserted itself in the mediation conversation. The world was waiting on this phone call between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Zelensky. But a lot of that momentum, to some extent, has dissipated. A lot of this peg two to the scandal. Remember the Chinese ambassador referring to the former Soviet nations that had questionable uh, sovereignty. A lot of that dented the credibility uh, of China and brought again this question of, is it really a neutral country? It is worth noting, however, the Chinese are sending a diplomat to Ukraine and Russia uh, this week. But again, when you look at the language from the G7, the Germans, but also Zelensky himself, they repeat the basis of peace peace should be Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, not the Chinese. And by the way, the Ukrainian president made another interview on Italian TV on Saturday and repeated the way he looks at things. There is no point in talking to Vladimir Putin. The country is betting everything on a successful counteroffensive. 
Okay, Maria, thank you very much. That's Maria Tadeo on the latest diplomatic push from Zelensky. Now, in other politics, a quick check on Turkey assets. It does look like we're heading towards a runoff with Erdogan, his main opposition. Um, we are looking at Turkish stocks falling nearly 3%. They did hit the circuit breaker earlier, about an hour ago. They resumed trading. The CDS, the five years there, jumping to the highest since March 21, of course, has a pretty illiquid market. Dollar turning into gains in Stocks with some exposure to Turkey, like BBVA, the Spanish bank, also seeing declines of 3.6%. All right, coming up on the program, from bodybuilder to the UK's youngest billionaire, we're going to start to talk with the Gymshark founder. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Turkish stocks resume trading after a circuit breaker as the nation's election looks to be headed for a second round of voting. The lira weakens along with European stocks that have exposure to the country. President Biden and House Speaker McCarthy plan to meet tomorrow as debt ceiling negotiations appear to gather momentum. Global equities move higher. Plus, Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky meets UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak after receiving promises of military support from Italy, Germany and France over the weekend. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, our next guest is one of the UK's youngest billionaire and a founder of a sportswear empire from very humble beginnings. I also want to bring in our very own Leanne Garrence to join me in this conversation. Leanne, fitting that we would be talking about athleisure, considering anyone can find us after these shows quickly changing into our gym clothes. I feel like that's all we've lived in for years. <laughs> and I feel like Danny Berger and I, we definitely enjoy the gym and we enjoy our gym clothes, don't we too? It is, <laughs> it is very true. And someone who perhaps is benefiting, benefiting from that is Ben Francis. Mm -hmm. He is the CEO and founder of Gymshark. Yes, indeed. And he does join us this morning, um, Danny Berger. So that's why we've opened the conversation with our love for us, a leisure wear. Ben Francis, thank you so much for joining us. Firstly, you opened a bricks and mortar store here in London in Regent Street seven months ago. Ben, how's mm -hmm. it all going? It's going incredibly well, thank you. It was it was a big step for us because everything we've ever done in for the last 10 years of our history was always been online. Uh, and we've always been keen to do something offline and move into a more omni-channel sort of approach. Um, and we actually signed the lease for that store during the height of COVID. So it was a big, big leap for us. But I'm really pleased to say that it's been a great success. So an absolute massive leap for you. And you said during COVID, are you thinking mm -hmm. the UK is a good place to invest? And are we going to see any more of these stores coming up on our high streets across the country? Uh, yes, I'm, listen, I'm an absolutely massive, massive fan of the UK and invested in the UK. I think we're, we're super fortunate in many ways. And that's not to say that it hasn't been a really, really tough couple of years for lots of people with, you know, increased cost of living crisis and, and um, prices and inflation and things like that. But what we have to remember is the UK is a really small country with a really, really, you know, high population. We can export out to the US and the EU really easily. Uh, and we're really optimistic about things moving forward. So is that, is that a yes to more brick and mortar stores, Ben? Oh, and then in terms of more brick and mortar stores, I think because of the success of our London store, I think we'd be stupid to not look into it. And that's something that we're just starting to look into now. Uh, all right. Looking forward to that. Um, I, I, I got to wonder, though, Ben, how strong is the consumer right now? Are, are folks still willing to pay 50 pounds for, for a pair of leggings? Uh, I mean, yeah, we're absolutely seeing that. And I think you'll be well aware there are lots of other companies that sell products significantly higher price point than us. We're, um, we're still at a very, very accessible price, price point. We're really, really confident in our product. We think the quality really does speak for itself. Um, and again, because of just the rapidly changing world at the moment, there are different weeks and different months where it, things spike and peak and trough and change. But at the moment, we're really confident and we are seeing the numbers come through particularly strongly over the last few months. Ben, I hear you saying that you're confident the numbers are coming through strongly. You've got a good price point going on. But we are seeing inflation eating into profits throughout industries. Where are you feeling the pressure? Where are you feeling the pinch right now? Yeah, so we've definitely felt it as all other companies similar to ourselves with raw materials, labor, uh, labor costs, freight. Um, like I will say, um, the last few months, things have definitely got better. 
Um, and we're starting to see those costs sort of ease slightly. So we're hoping that that continues. But like I said, the demand is there. Revenues are still growing. Um, and we do think a lot of that is because of the fact that we've continued to invest in our brand through the Regent Street store, through different marketing efforts uh, and things like that. Are you going to, though, cut down on some of your costs? Uh, there are reports that you let some of your staff go in the U.S. Is, is that part of this mission, again, to keep costs low and at the same time make sure profitability is still in check? Yeah, clearly we want to protect profitability, but we have taken a hit to our profitability, and that's because we really wanted to continue to invest in the into our brand. We want to build a 100-year brand, and we don't believe that you build a 100-year brand by only investing in that brand during the you know the periods of economic growth and prosperity we need to consistently invest over a prolonged period of time um and in terms of the restructuring of the business i've learned through my i guess short 10-year career working at gymshark from start up to where we are today that businesses de need different structures at different stages of growth but you know the requirements of businesses change depending on the macro environment as well um and we wanted to just restructure our business into a way that not only protects the, you know, the structure of the business, but allows us to be really agile. When we look forward to what will win in the future, we think that continued agility is going to allow us to, you know, really maximize the growth of our brand. So continued agility, you're speaking about there, Ben. What about an IPO here in London? Any consideration of that happening? Uh, we, to be honest, we're not thinking about IPO at the moment. Right now, it's all about really controlling costs, building out the best products and focusing on the core of our business. And like I said, building the most robust, strong, but also agile business that we can. Um, maybe that's something that we'll consider further down the line. But I got to say, your, your growth was astronomical and it, it really was about capturing onto the online trend. I mean, you were one of the first perhaps to, to be marketing on, on TikTok versus any other of these gym brands. For you right now, what is your medium of choice? What, what's the most successful medium for you to be advertising on right now? Is it still TikTok? Is, has something else come up that interests you more? No, listen, TikTok's really, really important to us. And like you say, we've gone from, well, TikTok not existing to us being one of the biggest brands on TikTok. Instagram, YouTube is still really important. Uh, Google and people browsing through the uh, the web in general. But honestly, our big bet is on being a truly omni-channel brand moving forward. We think that the biggest, most successful and, and genuinely most brilliant brands in the world have, have to be strong across all channels rather than just one or two. And you're right, we've had great success growing up on particular channels, particularly social. Now we want to be successful along them all. What would it mean for you if the U.S. moved to ban TikTok? What would that mean for your business? If the U.S. was to ban TikTok, I think, listen, it would definitely affect us. But because of the fact that we are so invested in Google and Facebook, Instagram uh, and different companies like that, as well as the, you know, omni-channel strategy that we're going to pursue moving forward, fingers crossed, um, then we think it should be, um, you know, well protected and mitigated. And just moving the conversation on slightly, Ben, when it comes to manufacturing and people are going green, we're looking at sustainability, are you investing in that? Where is Gymshark going when it comes to that look ahead in the future? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm heavily involved in this. I've literally spent the last few months travelling around different factories around the world. Um, and we we, we, have, we only really use U.S. cotton. Um, we use recycled polyesters and things like that. So we're becoming more sustainable than we've ever been. Every single season, we get better and better. And to be honest, I think we probably just don't talk about it enough, about how much progress that we have made from a sustainability point of view. But again, that will be coming in the next 12 months, where we're really going to be talking about some of the great wins we've had from, a, from an eco perspective and our, the build of our product. So I just want to sort of wrap up things with asking you, you are the, one of the youngest billionaires here in the UK. For anybody watching, looking to invest, looking to start a company, looking to start what you've done, what is your best advice to some of those people watching today? I think my biggest piece of advice would be just to try something. And you're right, like people talk a lot about Gymshark because Gymshark was the success, but they forgot, forget about the five, six, seven businesses that I started before Gymshark that, that failed. Um, and for me, it's really important just to try, try and try again, because the likelihood of an entrepreneur's first idea or first business being a success is relatively low. And the learnings that you get from failure are absolutely great. So my advice would be follow your dream, do something you're really passionate about, but ultimately just keep pushing forward and trying new ideas.
Oh, Ben, what a lovely call to action to end it on, an inspiration for all the young folk listening. <laughs> ben Francis there, Jim's Shark CEO, and our very own Leanne Garens. Thank you both so much for joining. All right, coming up, the gold sector gets its biggest deal ever as Newmont buys new crest for $19 billion. Why now? And is this as big as it gets? We're going to discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Newmont has secured a deal to buy Australian rival Newcrest in a deal that's worth over $19 billion. It's the gold sector's largest ever transaction and consolidates the U.S. miner's status as the world's biggest bullion producer. Harry Brumpton, our M&A reporter, joins in Sydney. So, Harry, we saw shares close Friday down about 3% off of the implied deal price. So did investors feel this was expected? Are they skeptical? What accounts uh, for that difference? Yeah, just a little bit of a difference there, uh, Danny. There's, um, you know, it, we, we'd had uh, interviews with Sherry Jew, the CEO of Newcrest uh, here in Australia, just a few weeks ago, where she, uh, she did tell us that the board was ready to recommend an offer, which was, you know, an interesting story at the time. So uh, the, the gap was pretty tight anyway, but um, there was a bit of a surprise last week when the, uh, the, the, the company extended due diligence for Newmont uh, and right, that threw up a few question marks about whether there was anything kind of going on or anything wrong with the, uh, the process that they'd seen so far. Ultimately, it just turned out that there was, you know, it's just such a big deal that there was a lot of paperwork, a lot of volume to get through, uh, you know, people uh, running documents in parallel and, and, and tails to some of the terms. So, uh, you know, it got there eventually and a, and a happy result for the shareholders that stuck with it. They're also going to get a frank to dividend as well, which is like a tax-free dividend, a special kind of dividend at the end of this as well if, uh, for, for those that stuck with it through the uh, process. Well, what is the rationale here for Newmont to do this deal and just become so enormous? Yeah, I mean, it uh, definitely puts them uh, just, uh, you know, purely back of the envelope scenario, well and truly the largest. I mean, the next largest is Barrick. It's going to be 60% uh, larger than Barrick, probably, uh, according to my rough calculations, on a, on a purely market cap basis by combining number one and, and number six uh, gold miners globally. Um, but, you know, there's more to it than just scale. I mean, there's the problem is that a lot of miners are facing... Uh, declining reserves because there's just not that much getting uh, getting found these days and also you know people are, are, are much more wary around uh, exotic exotic jurisdictions that they formerly would have been ploughing into uh, around Africa and uh, you know there's more sovereign risk in some of the countries where miners have uh, historically been uh, you know not, afa not afraid to tread. Uh, it's a pretty uneasy uh, you know political environment uh, globally these days so that factors into it. And on top of that, Newcrest is, uh, you know, very good at uh, some relatively novel uh, and new techniques. Uh, their mines, Katia and Lahia, are very uh, high production, high margin versus the Indi industry average anyway, uh, in terms of, you know, half, uh, have more than half a million ounces of output and, um, and, and, and really, high, um, uh, really high production volumes and, and, and uh, margins off that. Uh, and it's because of things like they have, you know, they've invented things like, or not invented, but pioneered uh, techniques such as block caving and uh, mineral extraction and chemical extraction uh, uh, processes as well. So that should add and, and could really supercharge some of the existing uh, Newmont assets as well globally. Are there going to be more major deal making in gold or is this kind of as big as it gets? I mean, I'm assuming it, it can't get much bigger. It would be hard to imagine. I mean, uh, Barrick, though, <laughs> however, um, you, you know, their CEO is a consummate deal maker, uh, and they kind of started this whole wave of mergers and acquisitions that uh, has, has been going back as almost as long as I've been reporting uh, on deals. Uh, you know, I can remember at least in 2018, it was a bit of a surprise that the sleepy old gold sector was starting to see some M&A again, and, uh, and Barrick pioneered that with their uh, $6 billion deal for Rand Gold resources. So, you know, never say never, and, and, and uh, especially, as I say, with these drivers behind it where... Uh, you know, uh, um, reserves and all reserves for, 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 for production going forward in high quality jurisdictions with, you know, s superb assets. Uh, people are going to be looking to those top tier players already rather than kind of junior explorers. So that puts more pressure on the top end of the barbell uh, for, for, for bigger mergers uh, going forward. But it will be hard to beat this for sure.
Okay, Harry, thank you very much. That's uh, Harry Brumpton, our M&A reporter in Sydney. Now, Siemens Energy shares are higher this morning after the company upgraded its revenue expectation for the year with strong orders for energy transition technologies. Now, that comes despite the Spanish wind turbine business continuing to be problematic, with the company forecasting a deeper loss for that division. CEO Christian Brook told Bloomberg that this will be a transitional year for the company, and we also asked him about the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. There's a continued strong demand also still for gas technologies. However, this is based on the capability to afterwards decarbonize these technologies and to convert them to hydrogen, where I think we are well positioned. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, the pleasure of the first half year and particular of the last quarter was that it really was very balanced in terms of the order intake. You also have seen mm -hmm. that we secured a large um, offshore uh, wind project in the UK, uh, which is also a good sign. It's the second largest Indeed. offshore wind right. project uh, which exists, uh, and this is obviously a good trajectory also in wind, despite Christian, obviously the that fact point, that we work through the problems. To that point, we can't talk about wind turbines without talking about Gamesa. Obviously, some of the profitability issues there are still clear. Um, what continues to be the biggest source of cost inflation, the biggest source of headaches when it comes to the supply chain for you? Uh, you know, we, we knew that we're going to work, uh, particularly on 23, through some of uh, the remaining issues. And this is why we always said it's going to be a little bit uh, volatile or bumpy ride throughout 23. 23 going to be a transitional year. It is nothing new in terms of what we're working through is really making sure that onshore recovers, that the startup of the new onshore platform gets more and more stable. They now go into operation. There's here and there, obviously, things to fix. Offshore is now ahead of a quite substantial ramp up. So we're hiring people, we're increasing factories, we need to get more output of the factories. So mm -hmm. this is, I would, working through the matters, it's not substantially uh, new, it's just working through it and we're on it and we always said it's not going to be done in a quarter. So you will need some patience with that and with us on that. Um, and we also ahead, don't forget, uh, a massive um, offshore auction period now, which is still coming in 2023 with big offshore orders. This will be on the order intake side, also an interesting development. Okay. The question is the patience of the market on the Gamesa side of the business for you. You use the word enormous, enormous grid building. Who is spending the most? Put some context around the word enormous grid growth. Is that in China? Is that in the Americas? Is that in Europe? Where is it and how much? Yeah, we see it obviously now really starting across the board. Obviously, uh, Europe has had started relatively early uh, with, let's say, long-term plans, and this is now coming to realization and implementation. So we uh, see the biggest chunk of the order intake in Europe, a uh, big chunk of that also in Germany. Um, but we also now see other parts of the world coming up. We see or we secured the first orders uh, also on the HVDC connections in the U.S. Uh, we see the Middle East, interestingly enough, having more and more discussions in terms of how to interconnect countries, how to interconnect regions. And um, I would say a little bit uh, coming later then is Asia, but discussions are happening at the moment everywhere globally. Europe will be the stronghold for 23 in this area for us, and we are well positioned there. But as I said, we continue to see changes elsewhere. And obviously, mm. uh, the IRA helps also to drive um, the element on the grid build out also in the U.S. Siemens Energy CEO Christian Brooks speaking earlier to us. Now, coming up, traders brace for volatility after elections in Turkey and Thailand. We're going to look at what the results mean for currency markets. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. The knock-on effects of elections in Turkey and Thailand are already being seen in currency markets. There's set to be more uncertainty. Turkey is heading towards a runoff election, while Thai, while Thai opposition parties have to try to form a government. Let's bring in Ven Ram on this Bloomberg Markets Live cross-asset strategist. Ven, let's start with Turkey, because there's certainly a lot of volatility priced into this market. If we are heading to a runoff, 
What happens in the meantime? How do investors approach this market? Well, it's, it's a constrained market, uh, Danny, for investors to be approaching the market, uh, approaching the leader positioning just yet. Because, you know, as you know, the, there is heavy intervention in the currency from the Turkish central bank authorities um, to the extent that we are talking about some 175 billion upwards uh, in the past couple of years. In April alone, uh, Bloomberg Economics uh, suspects the interventions amounted to 30 billion. So that's humongous part of the market is taken up by the central bank. So there is heavy price distortion. How this price distortion plays out will depend on the second round uh, vote runoff. If, if the opposition comes to power, then you would see the leader, you know, uh, unwind all the gains that it has seen in the in because of the prop up intervention. So the currency needs to come off the ventilator here, and the question is, when is it going to come off the ventilator? Now, now, when it comes to Thailand, it's perhaps a, a, a little bit different, but the, the same sort of impulse. If we get this immediate market reaction, we see the bot advance, opposition parties on course to, to get that power back. How long lasting is that strength? Because, of course, there's still some uncertainty in this market, too, in terms of how the, the final government looks. Absolutely, Danny. I think that, you know, it'll take, a, you know, any, any time between a few weeks to a couple of months for the government to be in place. And what kind of a government will be ultimately formed is still up in the air. We don't know the contours of the new government yet. Um, that uncertainty means that there may be short-term uh, short profit-taking in the part, but the part, unlike the leader, is a fundamentally better place currency simply because Thailand is an ex external creditor and its economy is growing much better than economists had forecast at the start of the year. So those two factors and the fact that we are going to have a democratic government possibly in Thailand after a decade-long rule of military government means that the fundamentals are in place for the, uh, for the part to consolidate its gains and build on those gains perhaps later in the year. Ben, thank you so much for joining us. What, what, what an interesting day when it comes to EMFX. Ben Ram there, Bloomberg Markets Live Cross Asset Strategist. All right, let's get you set up for the rest of the week and what we're watching. On Monday, we're going to get Eurozone industrial production figures. That'll be 10 a.m. UK time. Later in the day, BOE's Hugh Pill will be speaking about the cost of living crisis. Tuesday, UK jobs data and U.S. retail sales a few hours later. Wednesday, it's the latest Eurozone inflation figures. Also, BOE Governor Andrew Bailey speaks at a British Chamber of Commerce event. Thursday, Mexico Central Bank decision. Friday, G Summit kicks off in Hiroshima. So a lot to look forward to. Some inflation figures there after that Euro Commission this morning upgrading the view of inflation. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Anna Edwards in London and Kriti Gupta in New York. We're in this world where we know the risk of recession is high, but we're not seeing the whites of the eyes of it in hard data, and that's why we continue to have this sideways chop. Deteriorating macroeconomic data, high inflation, persistent inflation, especially wage inflation, and, and the recession. I worry that where the market could be most wrong about is actually pricing in cuts too early. So there's obviously a lot of event risk. But I would say we're, we're reasonably well set up in terms of the disinflation process that's underway. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. A boost for the Eurozone economy. A new European Commission forecast says it will grow this year at a faster pace than previously expected. But persistent challenges remain. We will speak to the Eurogroup president, Pascal Donahoe. Markets react to elections in Turkey and Thailand. In South Africa, the RAND rebounds amid signs that a dispute with the United States is easing. And coming down to the wire, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy resume talks this week on raising the debt limit. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. And Kriti, we keep the debt limit conversations front and centre this week. But of course, we have time to think about some emerging market themes uh, today, from the geopolitical ones to the strictly political. A, a lot to take in when it comes to EM themes this week. 
It certainly is, especially as, as you say, we wait for that stalemate essentially in Washington to kind of thaw a little bit. Nana, it's interesting as we talk about risk taking, EM is the perfect place to talk about it because even there, there are degrees of risk taking, if you will. It's not just about the geopolitics. You're also seeing some of the central banking fold into it as well, in addition to elections for some of the most volatile currencies around the world. Let's start with how that translates to futures, though, because as you see that movement, there seems to be a little bit more kind of appetite for risk here in the States at least in pre-market trading, futures higher by three-tenths of 1%. A two-year yield, though, that is still hovering around that technical level of 4%. We're at 398 there, unchanged, but the direction of travel is certainly down, and with it taking the dollar. As we talk about that, those EM FX pressures, it's going to show up in the dollar. It's simply the idea here that if the dollar weakens as a whole, EM as a whole uh, strengthens just a little bit, even in light of the volatility and the kind of presidential uh, elections that are taking place around the world. Something we're going to keep you up to date on in just a few moments. NYMEX crude also trading at a 70 handle, which Anna actually folds into the EM conversation quite nicely as we talk about just how much the inflationary pressures are affecting the geopolitics of these various regions. Yeah, absolutely. Inflation in focus in developed markets and certainly in many uh, emerging markets and playing into some of the politics that we're seeing, although there are very much other EM themes available right now. Let's have a look at where we are on European stocks. Uh, we've got the UK market up by two tenths of one percent, the FTSE 100 up by two tenths, the CAC Aeronte up by four tenths of one percent. Some of the luxury names over in, uh, in Paris benefiting from a slightly more risk on picture this morning. The DAX up a tenth of a percent. But let's think about that large area of red down there in the corner. That is, of course, the Turkish market coming under significant pressure. We'll get analysis on the ground shortly out of Turkey, but let me just underline the weakness that we're seeing in Turkish stocks today, down by 2.7%. And this is to do with uncertainty, and the market's not liking uncertainty. We could have had a verdict today. Looks as if we go for it to a runoff in these presidential elections, which means more uncertainty persists, and so stocks retreat in the meantime. That is extending beyond just Turkey domestically into other parts of the world, other businesses where there is exposure to Turkey. And BBVA, the Spanish bank, is an example of that. That stock down by 42 percent. Curry's is a retailer in the UK seen as a bit of a bellwether. They upgraded their guidance actually. The CEO talking quite positively about what he sees in the UK for the UK consumer which uh, increasingly surprises I suppose uh, on the upside. And Siemens Energy this is the energy business spun out of Siemens of course some time ago despite headwinds if you excuse the uh, use of that phrase that they, are, that they are experiencing with their Spanish wind business that is Siemens Gamesa. Uh, they have managed to upgrade their overall guidance as well because of uh, what the other part of their business does which is a of course, energy transition, Chrissy, and there's a lot of opportunity, they say, on that front. And of course, it's going to be a theme, again, that we see ripple across the world, uh, Anna. It's going to be a really crucial question. I want to get to one of those major EM stories, though, that you were talking about, starting in South Africa specifically. This is going to be really important as we talk about the RAND actually uh, moving. But before we hit that, we're going to talk about Thailand. This is going to be a really big story when it comes to uh, simply the geopolitics surrounding the elections that you are seeing around the world. And for that, we are going to go to our Asia markets editor, Margot Towie in Bangkok. Margot, Let's start there. Talk about the reaction and how significant it is in Thailand. Walk us through what we know. Yeah. Hi, Krita. Well, the, um, the election has been very interesting in the context that the pro-progressive um, parties really uh, took the vote, and surprisingly so. They were expected to lead, but not by quite such a margin. So they're now in a position to get together. Uh, former coalition and and hopefully government, they do face the hurdle of requiring the Senate, which is, was appointed by the military junta, to vote for them too. So that's the hurdle that remains. That will take a little while because we have, at the moment, a coalition that could be as many as five parties that have to come together, that has to agree on what they're going to do before it even gets to the point of putting forward a prime ministerial candidate that the Senate would vote on. That's where we are at the moment. So, so, so those are the next steps, I suppose, Margot. What happens from here? Yeah. Remind us what was what were the main themes that were being voted on in this uh, this democratic right, exercise? Exactly. This is this is this is the important thing. Now, the, the the party that led surprisingly is called Move Forward, and that's the most progressive party, um, and it's. Uh, platforms were very much change. It was it was very much based on change, more uh, choice, more uh, the ability to speak about things that are presently not allowed. You go to jail for talking about certain things regarding the monarchy, uh, liberalisation of same-sex marriage, um, liberalisation of certain 
sectors of the economy that are pretty much controlled by oligarchs. Um, and they really swept it. They swept Bangkok. They swept Greater Bangkok. It's surprising. Um, the party that they're most likely to form the coalition with is uh, affiliated with Thaksin Shinawat, who uh, was ousted in a coup. His sister replaced him. She was ousted in a coup. Um, his daughter, his, old, his youngest daughter, is a prime ministerial candidate in that party as well. So they are likely to forge together. Their uh, platform was very much uh, offering incentives to pull people out of debt traps, uh, pay off the bills, get a better life. That sort of thing, electrical, you know, electric prices are, are high because of quantity prices and so forth. So these these two groups that have similar similarities but are disparate um, will come together most right. likely to form a coalition with some others. Certainly something we're going to be keeping an eye on. Bloomberg's Margot Toey in Bangkok, keeping us up to date of another historic presidential election. We thank you as always. Let's now go to Turkey. I would say the highlight of the weekend. Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Eldin is standing by in Istanbul. Yusuf, you've been speaking to experts all morning for a record, a, a historical result. What has there been the reaction on the ground? Well, I'll caveat this much because I am battling street cats and street musicians for space alongside this beautiful bridge. So in case anything happens over the next uh, minute and a half or so. But in terms of the actual experts on the subject at hand of a first round election that caught many by surprise in terms of the preliminary results, what we had is Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the uh, longtime president of Turkey, about uh, yeah, well, almost going 20 years, he was able to show a level of resilience that the pollsters just got wrong. And what this means is that leaves us with a second round where the initial third contender is going to skip out. And the bigger question is how do those votes get reallocated? The initial thinking based on some of the people with close knowledge of the matter is that a lot of those votes are going to go to Erdogan, who's actually the stronger position from May 28 than he was in the first round. But there might not be that much time left, given the kinds of alarm signs we're getting from the economy and the markets. OK, yeah. And on that subject then, Yusuf, uh, so, so where, the, where the votes that went to the third candidate go from here will be crucial. How have the markets reacted? We saw I, I, I visited uh, the sort of stock market reaction earlier, which has been negative. Exactly. So out of the gates, we hit a circuit breaker. We're down a little bit over 6%. And now, you know, investors clawing back some of those initial losses. Uh, the banks, though, sold off hard. Uh, you look at some of the lira funding costs on an overnight basis, you know, those rose. The credit default swaps on a five-year basis, such an important benchmark for understanding how investors are feeling. Those rose to levels that we haven't seen since the end of March. Bonds sold off as well. Uh, the clock is ticking. Even in the case of an incumbent president who retains his power for another term, what is he going to do? Because the economy and at the rate, the current unorthodox monetary policy is burning through the reserves. I mean, there was such a big talking point throughout the morning. You know, they're going to have to move whether it's this administration or another one come May 28. Certainly something we've been keeping an eye on. Bloomberg's Yusuf Gamal Eldin sitting in Istanbul there uh, covering uh, all things Turkey election. Meanwhile, in South Africa, the RAND is rallying. And South Africa's finance minister says his country resolved a row with the U.S. over allegations that Pretoria supplied weapons to Russia and it's unlikely to face any repercussions. For more on the RAND and the direction of the general currency volatility we're seeing, let's bring in Ben Rom, Bloomberg Markets Live across asset strategists. Ben, it's interesting on today that we're talking about both the lira and and the RAND because, of course, uh, that has been a popular currency pair in the past in the EM world. How do you trade all the volatility in the, in the EM space right now? Morning, Kriti. I think the most interesting, one of the more interesting trades in the EM volatility space in, uh, in fact, involves both the RAND and the Lira. So you want to go the uh, long the uh, RAND against the Lira uh, in the short term. Why do we say that? Because if you look at the rand, it's been oversold last week, or we saw that selling in 10 selling last week. And at current levels, the lead, uh, the rand is flirting near a record, holding near a record. And if you look at the real effective exchange rate of the South Afri of South Africa, um, the exchange rate is undervalued on an REE or basis. And that is not sustainable over the long term. Uh, given that you know there are so many attractive points for the rand, it's cheap. 
And uh, if, if you believe in the commodity story, and if you believe in a turnaround of gold this year, I think uh, the RAND has, faces good prospects. On the other hand, if you look at the Lira, it's being propped up artificially, and there have been interventions mm. to the tune of more than $175 billion. So that's a good trade. OK, yeah, watching the South African uh, government and its relationship with, 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 Mo with uh, Moscow and Russia, certainly really interesting, and then the relationship with the U.S. as a result. Uh, back to the U.S., we're also following the debt talks, of course, in the United States. And, and Ben, I, I was talking to others on the uh, Markets Live team earlier on who seemed quite optimistic, really, about the fact that we've got a meeting, it's going to take place tomorrow, that could alleviate pressure. Others point to the fact that we're not near the deadline yet, and these things typically do get closer to the X date, and perhaps we'll see some markets market negativity intensify as a result of that. What's your take? Absolutely. I think that the markets, many parts of the markets are still not priced for the debt ceiling to intensify. People are thinking that, look, common sense will prevail, and then the lawmakers will come together and propose a resolution. Now, as we get closer to the X date, and the crucial point is that no one knows the X date for certain now, because it's supposed to be June 1, but we are supposed to get an update from uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen at some point. But I doubt it's going to be June 1. It is probably around the June 6th or June 10th even, because no one one can predict with certainty the cash flows that the Treasury will get will get in the near future because of tax receipts and things like that, which are difficult to kind of look into the crystal ball and come up with an exact number. But if you assume that the angst in the market is centered around June, the first 10 days of June, if you look at Treasury bills uh, maturing in one month, the yields have shot up tremendously more than 200 basis points in the in less than a month and that shows the angst and that will drop off into other complex uh, other parts of the markets if we don't see lawmakers coming together and finding a resolution Ven, thank you very much. Yeah, that angst only uh, visible, particularly in certain asset classes, then. We will see how that develops. Ben Ram of Bloomberg Markets Live, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up on the programme, we will go live uh, to Brussels for an exclusive interview with the Eurogroup president, Pascal Donahoe. That conversation coming up shortly as the European Commission upgrades its guidance around the Eurozone. Not such a straightforward conversation, though. And Sandra Horsfield joins us, Investec economist. We will uh, delve into her assessment of the Eurozone. Also, the debt ceiling debate looms large. And on that side, subject we will go to terry haynes pangea policy founder he'll give us his thoughts this is bloomberg the progressive firming of core inflation has set eu monetary authorities on a path of forceful tightening compared with our previous forecast market expectations point to higher rates, though markets still expect the ECB to be nearing the end of its tightening cycle. That was the EU Commissioner for Economy, Paolo Gentiloni, speaking as the Commission significantly raised its Eurozone inflation outlook for this year and next, warning of persistent challenges for the region's economy, also upgrading the, uh, the uh, uh, GDP forecast. For more, we're joined by our correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who is joined by the head of the Eurogroup, Pascal Donahue, in Brussels. Maria. Yes, yes, and he joins us uh, ahead of the Eurogroup uh, meeting. And Mr. Donahue, you told me, by the way, you were at the G7. You got back uh, from Japan yesterday, woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning. How are you even here? Uh, well, it is a Eurogroup meeting, so uh, I am here and looking forward to a very, very good and very full and productive day. And, of course, I'll be briefing my colleagues on the discussions that happened in the G7 in Japan. And, and on the G7, first of all, just to get it out of the way, I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to get this off the way, too, when it comes to the debt ceiling. Uh, how much of an issue was that at the G7? And does it really worry you? Or do you look at it and you say, ultimately, this always gets resolved? Well, Secretary Yellen, when she was in Japan, did emphasize how important this is for the American economy and did talk about the effects that could develop for the American and the global economy if agreement is not reached. But ultimately, we all have confidence in the ability of Secretary Allen and President Biden to resolve this matter. And it was very evident to me when we're there that they're treating the matter with the utmost urgency and hopefully in the coming days the matter will be resolved.
Well, let's uh, keep an eye on that. And uh, when it comes to the European economy, however, we had new forecasts that just came out. Let me get your take on this, because the way I look at this report is you could be positive and say, well, the job market is clearly still strong. Uh, The economy also, we saw GDP uh, up for both years this year and next. But you look at inflation, it is sticky and it's going to be longer and, and higher inflation than expected for longer. What's more problematic for you? What do you look at? Well, what is very positive is the fact that we're still seeing our economy grow for this year and next year. And particularly from a political and social perspective, we're seeing very high levels of employment. But the figures that were released today also underpin the challenge that inflation poses. And while we are expecting to see inflation decline, it's clear, particularly from a budgetary point of view, that we have to coordinate our efforts with monetary policy to facilitate inflation coming down. And the figures today demonstrate the importance of that. And before we get into the fiscal uh, policy, which I know you have a debate, or there will be a long debate from now until the end of the year when it comes to the rules. Uh, When you listen, however, to the words of Paolo Gentiloni, your uh, colleague, he did say it does seem the European Central Bank has entered the final stage of this monetary tightening that we're seeing. Would you share that opinion? Do you feel we're entering really that final uh, round? And do you still have confidence that the European Central Bank will get this right without breaking anything in the economy? You value growth. Can they hike rates, bring down inflation, and not crash the economy? I'm confident that they and we can get the balance right. There are clearly some signs that the inflationary dynamic is beginning to change. From an overall level, it's moderating downwards from where we were a year ago. But inside that inflation, we're still seeing core inflation at too high a level. Uh, And I do believe that across 2023 and 2024, the ECB and governments can take the steps that are needed to get inflation back down to a level that it will not be the challenge that it is today for living standards and for the ability of households and businesses to trade and live. And and not to get you to comment on the actions of the European Central Bank, because I know there's a very strong separation usually between the two, uh, but to be able to do this job, you have to at least have an opinion as to whether you feel the end of the hiking cycle is is coming. Do you have any thoughts uh, on that? We've We've seen a downshift to 25 basis points now. Again, it goes back to the confidence. Are we entering the final stage? I'd prefer not to comment really on what the ECB may or may not do in the future. And that is driven not just by a respect that I have for their mandate, but it's also driven by an acknowledgement that we are in a complex environment in which unknown developments could still influence where we might be in the future. But all that being said, what is important for me from a finance minister perspective is even though we still have a challenge with core inflation, the overall level of inflation within our economies is down versus where we were a year ago. And that is an important development. I hope that trend continues, which in turn uh, would allow us to take the steps that are needed to still preserve employment and a degree of growth in our economies. And let's talk about the financial sector, because, well, first of all, I want to get your thoughts as to do you feel the, the, the banking turbulence is is that over now for Europe? And then, I guess, in a perverse way, you could argue, could give you some impetus to finally get progress on the banking union, the capital markets uh, union. Today, you're going to be talking about this. Are you confident that this is now going to accelerate? I'm confident we can still make progress on banking union and capital markets union. Uh, I'm confident, for example, with regard to banking union, that the process for completing banking union is going to take time. But the way we complete banking union is by taking steady steps to deepen us. The Commission brought forward new proposals there a number of weeks ago in relation to different aspects of banking union. And I believe we will make progress on those proposals inside the current Commission mandate, which is up to the middle of next year. With regard to Capital Markets Union, we're going to review where we stand on that project today. And what I want to agree with my fellow ministers is a plan where we could identify priority areas for further progress on CMU. And we'd also aim to have that work complete by next summer. And just very briefly, at the G7, you had a statement in which, uh, well, you condemned Russia's war in Ukraine. No issues with that statement. And also repeated, we're in this for the long haul. However, do you detect it or did you detect any signs of financial fatigue when it comes to helping Ukraine. A lot of money has been, for obvious reasons, pumped into this country to help it fight Russia. But did you detect or pick up on any signs of that? I genuinely saw no evidence of financial fatigue. 
the G7 statement was unambiguous mm -hmm. in making clear our commitment to support the economy of Ukraine. And in the last number of weeks, we've seen progress now on agreeing an IMF programme for the Ukrainian economy. And even over the last number of days, we've seen further commitments from a defence perspective to support the people of Ukraine in the war. And so it's the G7 statement made clear, and as the finance ministers of the European Union have emphasised, we will continue to provide the economic support that's needed to the people of Ukraine uh, while they're involved in waging in, in this war, and ultimately, I hope, uh, taking this steps that are necessary to repel the Russian invasion. Well, Mr. Donahue, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good luck today and hopefully some sleep in the carts for you. Uh, well, Critty, that was uh, Pascal Donahue, the head of the Eurogroup. And again, we talked about this G7 statement, support uh, for Ukraine, and he referred to that mega package that was approved by Germany on Saturday, 2.7 billion euros to help this Ukrainian counteroffensive. As you know, Zelensky is in Europe today and has been over the weekend. Yeah, some great reporting there from Brussels. Maria, today we thank you, as always, with a crucial interview with the Eurogroup's president. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. As Maria was just pointing out, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky meets with UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today. The British government says it will be providing Ukraine with hundreds of air defense missiles and hundreds of new long-range attack drones. Over the weekend, Zelensky met separately with the leaders of Germany and France. According to U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, the number of migrants trying to cross the southern U.S. border fell 50 percent Friday and Saturday. That bucks expectations of a surge after pandemic-era border rules expired. The unprecedented jump in border crossings during recent months has been a political albatross for President Biden. A big transaction in the oil pipeline business, One Oak has agreed to buy Magellan Midstream Partners in an $18.8 billion cash and stock deal. It would create one of the largest oil and natural gas pipeline operators in the United States. The price represents a 22% premium to Magellan's closing price on Friday. Gold giant Newmont has agreed to pay $19.2 billion to buy Australian rival Newcrest Mining. That consolidates its position as the world's largest bullion producer. The deal also will boost Newmont's resources of copper, a metal where demand is expected to outpace supply. And a, a lot of consolidation in the commodity sector, but I gotta say, I think the Newmont deal really takes the case because uh, takes the cake, excuse me, because it's coming at a time when gold is at record high prices. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about what the link might be there. Does that signal uh, we're at uh, sort of peak levels in terms of M&A, or does it signal that there's more to come? Confidence in the valuations we see at this point, a conversation that no doubt will continue. Gold benefiting, of course, uh, from nervousness around the U.S. debt ceiling. We continue to watch those M&A themes, limited as they seem to be to certain sectors, including basic resources. Coming up on the program, we'll talk about the global economy. Sandra Horsfield joins us, Investec economist. We'll talk about the Eurozone, Eurozone growth story and, of course, the U.S. debt ceiling. This is back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. A boost for the Eurozone economy, a new European Commission forecast says it will grow this year at a faster pace than previous, previously expected, but persistent challenges remain. Markets react to elections in Turkey and Thailand. Meanwhile, in South Africa, the rand rebounds amid signs that a dispute with the United States is easing. And coming down to the wire, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy resumed talks this week on raising the debt limit. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, a lot to digest this morning. Of course, we are all on the debt limit watch, essentially those talks continuing in Washington. But it feels like today's market story is all about EM, all about FX. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a lot of EMFX stories um, being uh, being read on the Bloomberg terminal, being focused on by global investors uh, and a lot of news flow surrounding, as you say, Thailand, South Africa, Turkey, a lot to talk about. Come to Turkey in a moment. This is the Stocks Europe 600 right now, up by four tenths of one percent. Critty, to your point about uh, the debt ceiling debate, some suggesting that perhaps we're seeing a little more positivity at the margins around that. We have a meeting. It takes place tomorrow and maybe we'll see some progress. Others say we're not close enough to the X date to see any progress on that. 
those debt talks. That's not going to come just yet. And we might see some fallout in markets as we head towards uh, the, the X date, of course. This is the Turkish equity market picture, down by 2.8%. Is this just about uncertainty? I referenced that last uh, time we checked in on these boards. Uh, but is it just about uncertainty? We go into a runoff election situation. Or is it a verdict on the potential for another term for President Erdogan? Uh, we certainly got a comment from Moody's uh, coming through this morning. The ratings agency suggesting that if we do see Erdogan win another term, that means a continuation of unorthodox, there was unorthodox monetary policy. BBVA is the Spanish bank, but it is feeling the effects of the Turkish election. So we are seeing some banking stocks under pressure in Turkey. And uh, this is a bank that has exposure to that trend. So BBVA down by 4.6% this morning. There's another Spanish thing going on at the German business that is Siemens Energy, because there's weakness in their Spanish wind business, that's Siemens Gamesa. But that is being offset by broader positivity around the energy transition. As a result, the business is upgrading its guidance and the stock is up by 3.8%, Chrissy. Yeah, and speaking of things that are going up, S&P 500 futures are as well. We are starting to see that sentiment in Europe and a flow into the United States. A little bit momentum since the last time we checked futures here, higher by about four tenths of 1%. But to your point, it really is all about that stalemate. Remember, we ended uh, with losses last week, so it is natural to see a little bit of a bid coming into the market. But of course, M&A and some of that risk appetite for EM is going to factor into the sentiment you are seeing, uh, at least in the stock market. I would say the same thing in the bond market as well, although you are seeing yields a little bit higher. Two-year yield, they're really hitting right up against 4%. 3.9999, that is four nines behind the decimal point. And with it, you are seeing some movement in the dollar. I think the dollar story is really interesting because on the surface, Anna, the Bloomberg dollar index looks unchanged. But underneath the surface, weakness in the yen, compounded with strength in some of the commodity currencies, really following the story you're seeing in the likes of oil, copper, and gold, which brings me to those record levels or near record levels. You're seeing spot gold at 2015 on the precious metal, higher by three-tenths of 1%. You mentioned this earlier as we talk about that debt ceiling debate, that bid for safety very much showing up in gold. But I have to add, you're also getting some deal news in the gold space today, consolidation between Newmont and Newcrest Mining in the long term. What does that do to gold prices? Does that have an effect on a supply the supply story that's certainly something we're going to be watching Anna as again we talk about the trade that's going to be evolving this week as the debt ceiling limits progress yeah, absolutely. That debt ceiling certainly a focus for investors. And uh, interesting that, Chrissy, we saw the Markets Live survey of uh, financial participants uh, with, on the Bloomberg terminal certainly suggested that there are many in finance who think that the risks of default are higher this time than they were in 2011. We'll get to that theme in just a moment. Uh, Sandra Horsfield joins us, Investec economist. And I wanted to start... Good morning to you, Sandra. Thanks for joining us. I wanted to start by getting um, your thoughts on uh, the, the, the European growth story. We got these new forecasts from the European Commission an increase in GDP estimates, but at the same time they were saying that there's downside risks and those have increased. What's the direction of travel for Europe, do you think? I think in general, uh, the situation is clearly much better than it was, given the energy backdrop, mm. uh, given how much of an improvement there has been. The, as a net importing area of energy, the euro area has benefited. And we're seeing that carry through. At the same time, if we see the very latest trends in terms of confidence, isn't that all that great? The very latest manufacturing orders, etc., indicate there's still some real weakness and some real softness in production. We are perhaps less optimistic going forward because we're still having the lagged impact of interest rate hikes that's yet to come through. So perhaps not quite as much momentum as there might have been otherwise. Yes, and if you expect the ECB to keep hiking, even as the Fed maybe has paused, that seems to be what a lot of people are suggesting, what does that mean for European assets, for European stocks that started the year so strongly, and for the euro? Of course, we had a big disconnect early on where the Fed was much more aggressive in its tightening, and that had had big uh, differential repercussions. At this point, uh, markets are clearly at the point of thinking, well, the Fed is pretty much done here. We're heading lower with rates, but Europe is not there yet. So uh, from the currency perspective, probably that means a somewhat softer dollar, the counterpart being the euro, one of them. Um, and uh, that's also something that is likely to also weigh on, on the activity in the eurozone in itself. Sandra, good morning from New York. Uh, well, let's talk about the stickiness of those prices. Are you at all concerned about that trend, that deceleration, that almost uh, easing of hawkishness that you're seeing on both sides of the Atlantic turning around as we talk about perhaps sticky prices, as we talk about kind of these corporate price hikes that are then at the end of the day not necessarily going to change even after the Fed and the ECB alike perhaps end their respective tightening cycles? Your thoughts? 
I think it's difficult to say at the moment exactly how much of a softening we're going to get. We have seen this fall in energy prices we're talking about. We haven't quite seen that yet translate into lower goods price inflation. That is probably coming. Uh, but how much of an impact and how much of it is embedded in service prices too? It's a big unknown. We're still across uh, on both sides of the Atlantic dealing with very tight labor markets. They haven't really loosened. And in that sense, uh, I think the hawkish rhetoric really underlies that sort of picture. Yes, the economy may be decelerating um, more clearly in the US, but the labor market hasn't turned. In Europe, uh, we still have a strong labor market and perhaps less weakness uh, than had been expected early on in terms of economic activity. Sandra, I'm very glad you hit the labor market story because, look, I'm sitting here in New York. Anna's with you in London right now. And as we talk about labor markets, there are two very different approaches uh, that European governments take respective to the American government. How is that factoring into your thesis in terms of uh, kind of putting together the labor market with how the ECB is going to perhaps uh, deal with inflation in perhaps a different way than the Federal Reserve? Walk us through your thinking. Well, certainly... If we look at the inflation drivers, in uh, the case of the US, it's arguably the case that demand has generally been much stronger in an underlying sense. Europe has been held back in that respect. Um, but the labor market tightness is a common theme. Um, if we are at unemployment rates as low as they are, uh, but we're seeing some signs of cooling in terms of labor demand, that could help um, bring down inflationary pressures. In Europe, perhaps in an underlying sense, inflation pressures aren't as strong um, as in Europe. So perhaps it's not so much more tightening that's necessary, even by the ECB. We have one more hike uh, expected, could be slightly more. But I think in general, we're getting closer to the end of the tightening cycle. Mm. Sandra, thinking about the debt ceiling, you're, you, you bring an economist perspective to this, though. So I wonder what is in focus for you. I mean, some people suggest that as this conversation in Washington continues, that can weigh on consumers and maybe there's some negativity uh, then affected on consumers because of the talk about the debt ceiling and what that would mean. Is that your main area of focus when it comes to watching that Washington rhetoric? I think a lot of it is to do with what it means in terms of market interest rates. And consumers may be re reacting to the overall sentiment, but perhaps they are most of all focused on what this means for their own personal finances and their own personal borrowing costs. Of course, the event of a default in the US and what that would mean in terms of borrowing costs, um, there are lots of projections out there saying this could be really detrimental. So perhaps sentiment is affected by that um, to some extent. I think the bigger question is, does it happen or does it not? It's always gone to the wire um, in the past on these ones. And unfortunately, there's no sign that this time a quick resolution is in sight as okay. yet. Sandra, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Sandra Horsfield of Investec with her perspective on the global economy. Coming up on the programme, we'll get the latest on that US debt ceiling debate. Terry Haynes joins us, Pangea policy founder. This is Bloomberg. When is the debt uh, meeting, the leaders? In about 10 minutes. Seriously? Uh, you're holding it up. When is it actually happening, sir? We're working on it right now, the exact time. Will it be on it's Tuesday? Here. It's I been reported so. it'll be Tuesday. I think so. President Biden there taking questions from reporters during his bike ride yesterday, indicating more debt ceiling talks could come as soon as tomorrow. Joining us now to break it all down, Terry Haynes, Pangea Policy founder. Terry, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for waking us up, uh, waking up early for us. Uh, you're sitting at a 40 percent default likelihood. That makes me very, very nervous. But Terry, we've been through this iteration over and over again uh, in the past few decades. Why is this time different? Well, I think uh, all you can do is uh, is deal with what you uh, what we have in front of you, and uh, what we've got in front here is a situation where uh, we know that uh, the supposed X date is only a few weeks away, and uh, and we've still not got full engagement uh, from uh, the political negotiators here uh, with only a few weeks to go. So that greatly increases the possibility of some sort of mistake and. Uh, on that, I think uh, I broadly agree with Jamie Dimon, who uh, who 
pointed out the very same thing and called the, uh, the possibilities catastrophic. So, you know, my base case is that this gets resolved, but where we are today, I think, is, uh, is in a very delicate moment. And uh, what I want markets to understand uh, today, too, is that the likelihood of this getting resolved this week, I think, is very low. Uh, president, as, uh, as you just ran uh, footage of, uh, says that uh, they're likely to meet again Tuesday. That may be, uh, but at the same time, Biden's off to the G7 uh, immediately after that. So uh, the, the opportunity for some sort of resolution this week is very low, which, you know, again, heightens the possibility of a mistake. And as a consequence, heightens the volatility as well, a little over two weeks before we hit that uh, early June X date. Terry, what are the bendiest part of the deals, for lack of a better term? Where is there uh, kind of give and take when you look at the nuts and bolts of the actual agreement? Well, there's, uh, you know, the things are very soft uh, every, you know, on any possible component. Uh, there's no... Uh, there's no agreement, uh, as far as anybody understands, about how long the debt ceiling would either be raised for or uh, or suspended for. We've had suspensions in the past. Um, nobody understands uh, whether or not the administration is interested in accepting the House proposal to uh, roll back spending to fiscal 22 levels. Uh, nobody understands how uh, how porous or how strong a spending deal is actually going to be. Remember, in the United States, uh, spending deals don't happen really until the fall or winter. And one thing I've pointed out is that uh, the, there have been delays of three months and six months in the last two fiscal years just on spending deals alone. So uh, the possibility of continuing to string this out uh, for months to come is not uh, is not a small one either. Uh, so mm. uh, right now, there's not any real understanding of uh, what, how how strong a deal is, what its components might be, uh, or uh, or for how long it'll last. So all those things are additional worries for markets, I think. Terry, good morning. If we do see attempts to forge some kind of deal before the 1st of June, we still have 15 days to get there. And I wonder how you think the politics in that scenario would play out to sort of force heads together. I mean, is this something we're going to be talking about on the 29th, uh, uh, the 28th, 29th, 30th of May, you know, leaving it to those dates uh, later in the month before we get any kind of resolution? And I wonder what role the markets play here. If we did see a sell off in stocks with that focus minds in Washington. Yeah, I think, well, you know, I think mines are concentrated here, but uh, on this, but at the same time, uh, you know, work expands to fill the time allotted, and they understand that uh, an X date is early June, so therefore they've got the rest of May. So to answer your uh, your 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 last question, uh, yeah, I still think we're going to be talking about this uh, at the very end of May, and there's so there's likely to be some sort of crunch time. Uh, markets also need to understand e that even if there is uh, some sort of deal between the president and congressional leaders, the congressional leaders uh, and Biden himself still need to go sell this to their uh, to their parties. And there are factions within those parties. There are centrists of, in, in both parties who uh, who really want to solve the fiscal issues uh, as well as the debt ceiling issue and uh, and bring back some stability to the markets. And there are folks on uh, kind of the progressive left and the conservative right uh, who would, you know, who were going to be jockeying for advantage with, uh, you know, whatever uh, issues they're interested in up until the very last minute. So, you know, we're in for a very bumpy ride here between now and the 1st of June. Uh, are you focused, Terry, then on uh, meetings between members of staff who can go over the details, trying to find areas of convergence and agreement and, and make deals? Or are you looking at the main players, the principals in this, and, and saying it's only they who can effect real change here? Well, you know, this is a declaration against interest as a former senior staffer, but uh, I got to okay. say that uh, anybody that thinks that staff uh, meeting uh, amounts to uh, progress here uh, is hugely naive. Uh, the only people that can make this deal in the end are the principals. And, uh, you know, what staff are doing is, is right now is really coming up with parameters for how the, how deals might get resolved. You know, if we want to, uh, you know, if we want to cut back spending here or we want to uh, cap growth there, exactly, you know, what are our options? How do we do that? That's all important work, uh, but, uh, but only the principals can make this deal. This is not a staff-driven deal. 
Terry, what does the contingency plan actually look like? Our uh, star Washington reporter, Amory Hordern, had asked Janet Yellen this very question about whether, yeah. if we do hit that X date, do we only then, uh, does the U.S. only then pay parts of their debt? What is the thinking in Washington? What is the contingency plan? Well, I'm, uh, you know, in, in part because I'm informed by Anne Marie's interview with Secretary Yellen. Uh, uh, they don't have a, uh, a, a firm contingency plan. Uh, I think I think what's what can be said is that they have a variety of ways in which uh, default scenarios can play out. Uh, they haven't yet chosen which ones they want to uh, to, to trigger. Uh, they haven't presented that to the president. If I remember Secretary Yellen, uh, uh, I think she said that uh, they never did present those back in 2011 or 2013 to the president. So, uh, you know, they clearly want to wait quite a long time before they make a decision about what needs to happen and when. Okay, Terry, thanks very much. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thoughts on the debt ceiling this morning. Now, coming up, it is the largest ever transaction in the gold mining industry. More on Newmont Steel to buy Newcrest next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now let's take a look at uh, the things that are in focus for us this week. Today, Raphael Bostic will be speaking with Bloomberg's Michael McKee. That's at the Atlanta Fed's annual financial markets conference. Then on Tuesday, we get China's key economic data, including retail sales, industrial production and fixed asset investments. And we also get retail sales out of the United States. That could be the real data focus of the week. And Home Depot kicks off the retail earnings parade, so a lot of uh, focus on the consumer stateside tomorrow. On Wednesday, we'll get the latest Eurozone inflation figures and Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey will be speaking at a British Chamber of Commerce event. On Friday, the G7 leaders meet in Hiroshima in Japan and the Fed Chair Jerome Powell and former Fed uh, uh, Chief Ben Bernanke will sit down to offer their perspectives on monetary policy and answer questions at a conference taking place in Washington. Kriti? That's going to be an interesting conference for sure. I wonder what Ben Bernanke thinks of all of this. I want to take a quick look, Anna. The stocks we're watching in the pre-market trading in the United States because some of it is news flow. Some of it is actually technicals. I want to kick it off with Apple shares here. AAPL is your ticker for our radio audience. Higher by about two-tenths of one percent. Now, look, it looks like a small move on the surface, but the reason I bring this to uh, our the attention of our audience and to you, Anna, is simply the idea that on Friday, the market cap of Apple actually surpassed that of the entire Russell 2 thousand small cap index in the United States it speaks to the just how large Apple has become. And as we talk about that defensive bid coming off of those debt ceiling talks potentially into tech uh, or into commodities, Apple is one of those benefactors. Bad, benefic benefactories. I'm going to get that word right. Uh, higher by two tenths of one percent. So certainly keep an eye on that. It's not the only one moving though. Some M&A news in the works as well. One Oak at top of the mind to buy Magellan Midstream Partners for about 19 billion dollars, an energy pipeline deal that is actually going to make it one of the key players in the pipeline industry, starting to compete with the likes of Kinder Morgan or Williams. This is a big deal when we talk about just the kind of competitive landscape of the pipeline space. One Oak shares down just shy of six percent. Newmont Mining is the other one, of course, it is looking to buy Newcrest uh, Mining. This is a really big deal when we talk about simply consolidation in the gold space as we talk about record high prices. For more on that deal, we're joined by Bloomberg M&A reporter Dinesh Nair. What is driving this interest, Dinesh? How much of this has to do with the supply and demand story you're seeing in gold right now? Well, um, thanks for having me. I mean, it's clearly... Um industry has been uh, quite curtailed over the years. You know, gold miners are finding it increasingly and prices are at record levels. So I think scale has become like a really crucial factor in the gold industry. Um, so we've seen that over the years with the number of deals, whether it's like Barrick's Pursuit of Rand Gold uh, and the latest deal as well. Just on this uh, particular uh, transaction, uh, yes, it is a gold transaction. It's the biggest gold mining deal to date. Uh, but then uh, Newcrest is also a big copper producer. So you're seeing that as Newmont using the deal to also diversify mm. a little bit away to copper. Yeah, Dinesh, good morning. I was going to ask you what is driving Newmont 
wants interest in new crest specifically yeah. and this is very much about gold but also as you say copper so is this something about the new economy and energy transition as well yeah, big time. I think uh, what we're seeing in the mining industry today is this huge demand by the miners to diversify into metals which are seen as friendly, uh, you know, f f to renewable uh, energy and energy transition. Uh, so we've seen a wave of deals. Uh, there was Glencore's pursuit of tech resources um, and um, BHP's deal for OS minerals. Um, you see, in all these deals, I think copper is a very important commodity that is seen as a metal which is potentially going to propel the industry's push towards um, renewable energy. So I think, um, the, you know, we've seen a very busy time in mining m and uh, quite contrary to what we're seeing in m and overall. Yes. Um, I think the driving factor has been uh, the, 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 the urge to get supplies of metals which are keen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I pull up the MA function, the MA Go function on the Bloomberg yeah. terminal. It tells me that mining basic resources is one area of green year on year when it comes to m and Other areas uh, not so positive. Thanks very much to Dinesh for joining us, Bloomberg. Dinesh and I are on the uh, M&A stories and the mining sector within that. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is up ahead. This is Bloomberg.